wrestling too. Yeah. Oh, you're the co-organizer. Sorry? You're yeah. organizing this. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Okay. <coughs> so, please be, please be rude. Please be rude. Okay. <laughs> Just stop. Good morning, everyone. So it is uh, a pleasure to introduce uh, Neil Turok, uh, who is going to talk about path integrals and the universe. So the universe is yours. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. And thanks to Gerald for the invitation. Um, I'm going to tell you about an application of path integrals to a very big problem, um, namely the universe. Uh, <laughs> maybe the biggest problem, uh, but actually rather small compared to the consensus uh, view, as I'll explain. Um, a few papers. Uh, recently, we've put out five uh, short papers on this topic with Latham Boyle, uh, based on some earlier work uh, we did. Um, and just to advertise something perhaps more directly relevant to this workshop, We've uh, recently put out a long paper on picard lefschetz theory as applied to quantum mechanics um, and, uh, and their references in that. So I kind of had a choice today as to whether or not to talk about this very technical and difficult work, namely defining path integrals in real time uh, rigorously. We think we've made some steps towards that. Or I was going to talk about something uh, very uh, exciting and ambitious and brand new, which is uh, about the application of path integrals to the universe. So I chose to do the, the latter. Um, and so this will mostly be a pictorial talk um, uh, to motivate the study of path integrals and the universe rather than uh, dwelling on the technical details. So starting point is why do we need a rethink? Well, this is the current consensus about cosmology, which is that the singularity is incomprehensible. Um, the, th it was succeeded by a period of inflation, which is a made-up uh, epoch in cosmology, which preceded the standard hot Big Bang. And the only role of this epoch is to prepare the universe for its simple and... Uh, 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 pristine evolution subsequently. So basically the idea was that the universe was somehow in a rather messy random state. You introduce this dynamite called inflation to blow it all up and make it very smooth and simple and that's what we see. And the consequence is that on very large scales the universe is crazily complicated and even more incomprehensible. And uh, so a surprising number of people uh, are interested in this concept of a multiverse, um, where our universe is just that what we see is a small piece of this infinite ensemble of different universes, um, and the universe is very wild and chaotic on large scales. It's absolutely not what we observe. Okay, so uh, personally, I think this is uh, likely to be a theoretical dead end. I think we need to take the observations much more seriously and, uh, and build theories that are much more firmly grounded in the basics, and that's what this talk is all about. In particular, uh, inflation predicts uh, gravitational waves produced from this early phase of exponential expansion and these are not seen, and the experimental bounds are coming down and down and down. This is the current state of play. Um, I had a bet with Stephen Hawking 
while he was alive, and we were both working next door, that um, the signal would fall below 5%. Um, and uh, and uh, Stephen agreed to that bet. Well, now it has fallen below 5%, uh, but he's not around to pay what he owes me. Um, uh, and uh, it's ever sinking. Uh, so one can make inflation models in which this signal is arbitrarily low. That's one of the things I don't like about inflation. It's extremely adjustable. But the simple potentials like phi to the fourth was ruled out a long time ago. Phi is not even on this plot. Uh, phi is up at 0.3. Phi squared is now ruled out. And people are playing with potentials like this, which is a little bit strange. Uh, this has no minimum. Well, neither of these have a minimum. But uh, anyway, this is where the consensus has led to rather strange and contrived models in this crazy multiverse on large scales. So what's my point of view? Well, I think let's start from what we know. Uh, this is the physics we know is valid, at least in some regime. And, uh, and it works pretty well. In fact, it works amazingly well. Uh, here is uh, gravity gauge theory, particles described by, by uh, Dirac's equation and the Higgs field. And as far as we know, this describes everything. We haven't seen anything clearly inconsistent with this description. So and notice I've written it as a path integral. All amplitudes are, uh, as far as we know, are described by this formula. Um, and let's just uh, let's start from this and look for deeper, look deeper at this formula, i.e., one immediate question is: Do path integrals like this make sense? They're still not. Uh, nobody has succeeded in defining them uh, properly. Uh, picard lefschetz theory is our best uh, best bet. Um, but uh, basically, this is telling us that the every process in the Every physical process is nothing but an interference pattern. This is a sum of phases. You add up all the phases, and, uh, and you get the, the amplitude, and thus the probability. So let's think more deeply about this formula, and let's start looking for simpler explanations of uh, the universe we see, which is stunningly simple. Okay? So on small scales, particle physics, the surprise is how simple things are. Uh, Large Hadron Collider has not discovered any new particles beyond what we already knew or strongly suspected were there. Here are all the particles uh, we know of. We, uh, the simplest addition to the standard model is three right-handed neutrinos. Very good evidence for these uh, from neutrino oscillation uh, measurements. Solar and atmospheric neutrinos. And uh, as far as we know, this is it. There's no evidence currently for anything beyond this. Surprisingly simple. Well, the large-scale universe is even simpler. Even simpler. It's amazingly simple. Uh, all the observations we have currently are consistent with just five parameters describing the large-scale universe. Three for the matter or energy content, the baryons per photon. It's just one number, the dark matter to baryon density ratio, that's another number, and the cosmological constant, or sometimes called dark energy. So three numbers for the matter and energy, two numbers for the geometry. Uh, these are conveniently param parameterized by the gravitational potential, the Newtonian potential, as uh, far as we can observe, is a random Gaussian field with an RMS, which is approximately scale independent. So it's an amazing clue. Just looking at the microwave sky or the galaxy distribution, we see a scale invariant spectrum of uh, Newtonian potential. There's a small, uh, there's a certain amplitude, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 5. And in this talk, I'm going to tell you how to calculate that amplitude from the standard model. OK, it's kind of crazy. But uh, you'll see, um, uh, this is a new, new result. We believe we can explain this number. It's essentially a fine structure constant squared uh, is, is this number. And um, so that's the amplitude. And then there's a small red 
tilt, meaning that the RMS fluctuation amplitude grows slightly at longer wavelengths, only 2% effect. And uh, uh, so these are two numbers. And they suffice to explain everything that we see. And there are now many, many, many observations which are completely consistent with this. Many quantities consistent with zero, which a priori would be allowed, like the spatial curvature of the universe, the gravitational wave amplitude, um, uh, uh, deviations from what's called adiabaticity of the perturbations, and so on and so on. So let's try to explain this simplicity with the simple formula I showed you before. Here's the cosmic microwave sky. Um, here's the fit to a theory which was postulated long before, scale invariant spectrum of Newtonian potential perturbations, fits beautifully uh, with just the parameters which I've showed you. And then uh, in 94, I was new in this game, and we calculated the correlation between the polarization and the temperature of the microwave sky. Previous authors had claimed this was zero. Uh, we calculated it. It's not zero. This curve is, has no free parameters. If you fit the model to this curve, so you fit those numbers I showed you to this curve, this is a complete predi this is a prediction with no freedom, and it fits perfectly. Okay, so this convinced me something really simple is going on in the universe. It, it obeys the laws we know. The laws that go into this are plasma physics and uh, uh, the Einstein equations plus the assumptions I listed on the previous slide. So it's really amazing. My point of view is that the basic puzzles in cosmology are our best clues. Let's think about these puzzles. Let's not ignore them. And in fact, my basic principle is let's not introduce any new parameters or particles. Okay, we've been doing that for 40 years. It's led to the multiverse. Let's just tie our hands and say no more, <laughs> okay? No arbitrary particles. Uh, we're not allowed to add any more. There's no evidence for them. Let's try to solve these problems without adding anything more. And Occam's razor should be our overriding principle. Okay, so start with the Big Bang singularity. Completely crazy. I'm going to explain our point of view that the resolution of it is, is conformal symmetry and analyticity, okay? And you'll see, you'll see why. The large-scale geometry of the universe, why is it so symmetrical? The universe is almost the same in all directions, and it's spatially flat. Euclid could have described the geometry of our universe, okay? You don't need Einstein to... There's no spatial curvature. It's just 3D flat space. Um, uh, why? And I'm going to tell you a new resolution, which is that there is a measure on four geometries provided by the gravitational entropy. We've calculated it using the standard model of, of uh, what we know, and, uh, and it predicts that the most probable universes are flat, like, like the one we see. The vacuum energy, I'm going to explain, if I have time, a new cancellation mechanism. This is really something that hits you in the face if you do quantum field theory in a curved space-time you immediately discover these anomalies that doesn't actually make any sense, the theory. And uh, as I'll explain, we found a new way of canceling the anomalies and making at least uh, at free field level this much more sensible and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about CPT, CPT symmetry. Once you open your mind to this point of view, the solution of the dark matter puzzle becomes kind of obvious, right? Dark matter is one of the things which have motivated all this model building. But I'm going to explain that the dark matter was already on one of the slides I showed you. Okay? And uh, this is the new work. It's not yet written up, but I will give you a flavor of it. So let's talk about conformal symmetry and analyticity. So when we study cosmology, we deal with line elements like this. These are so-called Friedman-Robertson-Walker universes in which space is taken to be maximally symmetric. And the, the whole dynamics of the universe, the, 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 if you like, the zero mode of the universe is uh, described by the scale factor. OK, 
Okay, so this is a convenient way to write the line element. Uh, and T here is called conformal time because the metric is conformal to a static metric. So then there's a rather uh, immediate consequence, which is that if we go back to the Big Bang singularity, right, very high temperatures, um, and let's imagine that the matter is conformally symmetric. Okay? First approximation it is because it's radiation, hot radiation, which has P equals one third rho, traceless stress tensor. But um, it's not much of an extrapolation to imagine that conformal symmetry actually became exact at t equals zero. Okay? It's a hypothesis. Um, and in fact, one could say that the only, or almost the only conceivable explanation of the Big Bang singularity would be in the theory that's conformally symmetric. Why? Because the scale factor goes to zero. And the only way to describe physics when the size of the universe goes to zero is if the size doesn't actually matter. The physics is independent of the size, so who cares that it goes to zero? It's, uh, you have conformal symmetry. So if we make this our starting hypothesis, that the stress of the stress tensor was zero at the Big Bang, then of course the Einstein equations imply that the Ricci scalar was zero, and then it's very easy to see that this function A of t is analytic at t equals zero. Okay, just write out the equation and you find the solutions. If you look in more detail, this is the zero, zero component of the Einstein equations. It's the Friedman equation or uh, Hamiltonian constraint. And it looks like this for a realistic universe in these coordinates. Okay, so the, um, the, the, the Friedman equation is, uh, only involves velocities, no accelerations. So a dot squared, rate of change of the scale factor squared, is given by these formulas. So you see for radiation, you have a constant, r, describing the density of the radiation in a conformal frame which, where you've removed the expansion. And obviously the solution to this equation is that a is linear in t. a is square root of r times t. But now add everything in that we know of in the universe. There's matter, there's space curvature, and there's uh, cosmological constant or dark energy. Um, I haven't put any numerical factors just so that you can see how simple the equation is. And actually just looking at this equation, you realize it has an analytic solution, which is an elliptic function, a particle moving in a quartic potential general solution is a, is a Jacobi elliptic function. And amazingly enough, before our work, nobody realized that. That's not, not a known fact. Uh, most cosmologists would very happily just solve this on a computer. So who cares that there's an analytic solution? Maybe people in this room would care. Um, but uh, so as far as I know, we're the first people to realize this is analytically solvable. Now, that doesn't really matter. As I said, you could solve this on a computer. But what does matter is to understand its complex analytic properties. Because as soon as you realize this is analytically solvable, you realize that in the complex plane, it has remarkable properties. Namely, it's doubly periodic. It's periodic in, in, a, if you like, in a real direction, periodic in an imaginary direction. As soon as you have periodicity in imaginary time, you have a temperature, and then you have an entropy. Okay, so it all follows uh, from this more or less trivial observation. So here is a typical solution. In fact, here are all the solutions. Um, the one we'll focus on is this blue one, which seems to be the real universe. Uh, the scale factor came out of a singularity at which A was linear in T. And the scale factor diverges to the future as uh, 1 over T. It has a simple pole. And that's the solution to a universe with a cosmological constant, is that A, this conformal, um, this conformal factor or scale factor, has a simple pole in T. So we live here. In our past was the Big Bang singularity, and our future is a simple pole. That's a future, future asymptotic infinity of dissidus space time. Um, and so here it is. A of T is now, then, the importance of knowing the analytic solution is you can see its structure in the complex T-plane. 
it's single valued in the T plane and doubly periodic. It's only singularities of simple poles. Periodicity in imaginary time implies the Hawking temperature. Okay, so um, that's what I'm going to use. Now, I just want to mention in passing what initially motivated us to study this space time was actually solving the dark matter problem. Okay, what's the dark matter? And there are tens of thousands of models of the dark matter. But as I've explained, we, already, we could already tell what the dark matter is based on what we know and this fact. Why? Well, let's take this seriously. Let's take this analytic structure seriously. It's telling us that the universe has a mirror image universe before the Big Bang, where A of T is negative, but of course A squared is positive. M line element is fine. And, uh, and, 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 and that's what the universe looks like, okay? And what this means is that the universe, the analytic extension of the space-time we know, this to negative T, is actually at CPT symmetric uh, image. Okay, so C, this space-time has CPT symmetry. T goes to minus T uh, is time reversal symmetry. With C and P, uh, you have CPT symmetry of the laws of physics and the background. So our hypothesis was extremely simple. The universe does not break CPT. Okay, uh, th that's it. From this, we could, uh, and knowing the scale factor, A of t, we solved the Dirac equation for right-handed neutrinos. Um, that equation, um, essentially because uh, neutrinos are conformally symmetric apart from the mass term, and the mass term just turns up, ends up going like t squared, so it's analytic, and so you just solve the equation for right-handed neutrino on this space-time, impose CPT symmetry on the vacuum state, and that automatically predicts how many right-handed neutrinos there are in the future, uh, in the asymptotes of this universe. Okay, so there's no adjustability in this aside from the right-handed neutrino mass. There's one parameter. They're created as a type of Hawking radiation from the Big Bang itself, and we fit the dark matter observations if the right-handed neutrino mass is 4.8 times 10 to the 8 GeV. So that's a prediction of the theory. Turns out that, so this is a really simple explanation for the dark matter. Just one of the three right-handed neutrinos happens to be stable, um, uh, which is consistent with uh, what we know of, uh, of the standard model. And uh, there's a very clear prediction, it turns out, which will be tested in the next three to five years, which is that if, and I'll show you where the prediction comes from, uh, comes, from, uh, comes from, so here's the right-handed neutrino, this one is the dark matter. Prediction comes from this, so this is the seesaw mechanism, which explains the left-handed neutrino masses. The left-handed neutrino can oscillate into a right-handed neutrino, a virtual right-handed neutrino, for a brief instance, uh, and then oscillate back into a left-handed neutrino. And as you turn up the mass of the right-handed neutrino, the oscillation lasts uh, shorter and shorter, and the effective mass of the left-handed neutrino goes to zero. That's why it's called the seesaw mechanism. Now, if you switch off this coupling, then um, the, right the corresponding right-handed neutrino is stable, because this is the only decay uh, mechanism. So then it becomes a dark matter. But switching off this coupling means that the corresponding left-handed neutrino is massless. So the prediction, if, the, if one of the right-handed neutrinos is a dark matter, then one of the left-handed neutrinos is massless. And that prediction is going to be tested in the next three to five years. Uh, we already know two mass differences. We know there are three light neutrinos we know two of the mass differences from atmospheric and solar oscillations. We don't know the absolute scale of the masses. So our prediction is that the lightest neutrino is massless. Okay, and, uh, and basically here is the current data. Uh, the prediction, essentially there are two predictions depending on the normal or inverse hierarchy. The inverse hierarchy is already uh, almost ruled out. 
Um, and so most likely it's a normal hierarchy. Uh, here are the current data uh, pushing downwards and the prediction is 0 .0, 0.06. So as the data uh, get more and more powerful, which they will very quickly with uh, new surveys, the uh, prospect is of the, this Gaussian curve essentially focusing around 0 0.06. And uh, this should be possible with 0 0.06 representing about five sigma in, uh, in the measurements. Okay, so if this works the way we predict, then I think the dark matter puzzle is essentially solved. This is easily the simplest model anybody ever made of the dark matter. Uh, here's, here's the five sigma I mentioned. Okay, now the main thing I want to talk about in this talk is this problem, emphasized by Roger Penrose, that the large-scale geometry of the universe is amazingly simple. It's homogeneous, isotropic, and spatially flat. It's consistent with Euclidean, uh, literal Euclidean geometry. And so Penrose imagined the creator, you know, picking this needle out of a haystack and saying, that's the universe I want. How to explain flatness? Okay, so I'm going to use an analogy that, uh, you know, when I walked to the Newton Institute this morning, I didn't have to worry about the curvature of the Earth because I didn't walk very far. And uh, so here, here we are uh, in the UK. As long as we travel tens of kilometers, something like that, we really don't know about the flatness of the, universe, of the Earth surface. But uh, let's try and explain why it's flat anyway. Why, why is the surface of the Earth so flat locally? Okay, and, and uh, uh, this is a real picture from space. And you can see it's really this polished, almost perfectly smooth uh, uh, rolling ball, bowling ball. So one explanation is somebody made the universe. There was a mechanism and somebody hammered it into shape and made it, and this is essentially the inflationary mechanism. Let's cook up a mechanism for flattening and smoothing the universe. It's not a very good explanation. There's a much better explanation, which is that the Earth is large. It's a big number, 10 to the 50 atoms in the Earth. And then we have gravity, dissipation, and uh, entropy. Gravity pulls things in. Dissipation means they don't rebound or oscillate. A, a, a very complicated geometry here with uh, spikes and so on. If one of the spikes collapses due to dissipation, its potential energy is converted into heat. And, uh, uh, and uh, there are vastly more ways of distributing that energy among the heat, among the motions of the molecules and atoms of the Earth than there are for putting very spiky, uh, creating very spiky geometries. And so uh, entropy explains why the, unit, why the Earth is so round and flat. Um, I have to mention there's some beautiful recent supporting evidence for this explanation, which is that the large mountain ranges on Earth are, surprisingly enough, they were formed shortly after uh, life filled the oceans. Uh, what happened is that there was an explosion of plankton in the oceans, and they ate up all the carbon dioxide. And the plankton then died and fell to the seabed and formed a layer of graphite. Uh, they were squashed by sedimentation, and converted into graphite. And as you probably know, graphite is an excellent lubricant. So now what happened is as the continental plates on the surface of the Earth were floating around, and when they collided, there was now a lubricant, and so adjacent plates slid one above the other. And that's how all the large mountain ranges were formed. Okay, the Andes, the Rockies, the Himalayas. And this recent work, uh, just last year, studied I think 15 or 20 of the largest mountain ranges on Earth. In every case, there's a thick layer of graphite which uh, is correlated with the existence of these peaks. 
So basically, this says when you remove the dissipation, indeed, you form uh, but more um, random geometries. Gravitational entropy. Okay, so this is what we're going to use to explain the geometry of the large-scale universe. We won't have atoms. Instead, we'll have gravitational microstates. Okay, the number of uh, uh, quanta, if you like, of uh, the geometry. Um, uh, that will be analog of the entropy of the, uh, of the Earth. Um, and so this topic is still a bit mysterious, but there is by now a lot of evidence that one can associate an entropy with a space-time. And this is the topic of black hole thermodynamics. It started in the 70s and recently um, has had a renaissance associated with uh, holography and ideas and similar ideas. So we're going to use this concept. We're going to calculate the, the entropy of a cosmological space-time. And this is the first time it's been calculated. And what we'll discover is that the uh, largest entropy space-times are those which are flat, spatially flat, just like we see. Okay, So um, just as we don't need initial conditions from the air, for the air in this room, right? The air in this room is very homogeneous and isotropic. We don't need initial con a theory of initial condition to explain it. It's just the maximum entropy state. And likewise, for the universe, the maximum entropy state turns out to be flat, homogeneous, and isotropic, just like what we see. So uh, uh, the starting point of these studies were the ob Hawking's observation of uh, made just near here that uh, black hole has a temperature. Soon afterwards, this was realized that it corresponds to an entropy. The entropy is proportional to the area of the horizon and the mass squared of the black hole. Um, and so these are very famous uh, formulae. Moving one step closer to cosmology, the simplest possible cosmology is de Sitter space-time, where you have a cosmological constant and Einstein gravity, and the solution is just this four hyperboloid embedded in 5D Minkowski space, and uh, that's de Sitter space-time. So <coughs> Hawking and collaborators, Gary Gibbons and Malcolm Perry, figured out how to calculate the entropy, or the temperature and entropy of de Sitter space-time, and the calculation is almost trivial. You take de Sitter space-time, you write it in global time coordinates, continue the time to imaginary values, usual wick rotation, and it becomes a four-sphere, obvious solution of the Euclidean-Einstein equations. The Hawking temperature is nothing but the uh, length of a great circle on the four sphere, and, uh, and, and so here it is. And then, as I'll explain uh, slightly more formally, the gravitational entropy is just the exponent in the path integral, Is. Uh, I've, I've put h bar to one, but it should be Is over h bar. It's the exponent in the path integral as calculated on this classical solution. So it's a saddle point uh, calculation of the entropy. So Is is, of course, the negative of Euclidean action. Euclidean action looks like this, the usual Einstein-Hilbert term, the dark energy or, or cosmological constant uh, energy density. And uh, using the trace of the Einstein equations, this just becomes rho lambda times the volume of a four sphere. Put in the volume and you get um, the radius is h inverse put in the volume and you get this uh, formula for the gravitational entropy. Today, we have a cosmological constant. If you work out in magnitude the value of the entropy, it's 10 to the 122. So there's huge entropy associated with the geometry uh, corresponding to an empty universe with nothing but cosmological constant. So at face value, if you believe this calculation, which I will, Okay, uh, it counts the number of microstates. Number of microstates is just e to the s. 
But what, so de Sitter spacetime is not particularly interesting because it doesn't have any matter or radiation in it. But, uh, and, and essentially, yeah. So, but we're just going to generalize this calculation and calculate the entropy of a realistic universe as a function of the cosmological parameters. And then we'll understand how, uh, you know, what type of space times it prefers. So, a few subtleties about the calculation. A realistic cosmology is not close to equilibrium, obviously. It came out of the Big Bang, it's going towards future de Sitter space. Um, it, it's not perfect de Sitter. De Sitter is uh, completely um, symmetrical, has maximal symmetry, so every point is the same as every other point. So, de Sitter spacetime is really in equilibrium. Uh, the real cosmology is not. It's not asymptotically flat, like a black hole. So you don't have the mass of the black hole as a parameter to play with. There's no asymptote in uh, a realistic cosmology. No asymptotic uh, space, spatial, uh, no asymptotic boundary to space. At the very least, we have two very different temperatures. We have the radiation temperature, three degrees Kelvin today, hotter in the past. And we have the de Sitter or Hawking temperature which is about 10 to the minus 39 of the radiation temperature today. So it's tiny. So you've got these two different temperatures. So obviously it's not in equilibrium. Third, third subtlety is that for spatially compact space times, and that's what I'll assume, either um, a spherical geometry uh, for positive curvature or a compact hyperbolic geometry for negative curvature. So it's basically a subspace of a three hyperboloid. So I'll take space to be compact. And then there's no boundary. And so the total Hamiltonian <coughs> turns out to be zero. So how do you do thermodynamics when the Hamiltonian is zero on all states? OK? Uh, and, and that's what we'll do. So one can still define a statistical ensemble. Um, and the key is to realize that the expansion rate of the space time, or the rate at which things change, is much smaller than the radiation temperature. And so the typical time scale of the radiation is minuscule compared to the time scale of the change in the space time. So the space time evolution is adiabatic as far as the matter is concerned. So that says, first trace out the, the radiation and matter, and then perform the gravitational path integral. So, I uh, want to make, um, yeah, there's something very interesting property of part. So we're going to use the path integral. We're going to trace over the radiation and then do the gravitational path integral. Uh, something maybe of interest to people in this workshop is that um, for path integral amplitudes, transition amplitudes, one can, quote, prove that the exponent is always have to be, has, to be, has to have a real part which is negative. Okay, this is essentially the picard lefschetz theorem. It says that any relevant saddle point has to, be, um, has to have a height uh, lower than the height of the integrand on the real axis, which is, so integrand is one on the real axis. So mod e to is, has to be less than one, and there's a series of papers with Feldbrugger. We use this to disprove the hartle hawking proposal for the quantum uh, wave function of the universe. Um, so that's transition amplitudes. What about statistical ensembles? So here, it's quite different. You're not calculating a transition between one pure state and another. You're calculating a trace. You can also write that as a path integral with imaginary time, so the amplitude is periodic in imaginary time, uh, beta. And uh, we all know the partition function is e to the s minus e over t. Not very surprising that this is exponentially large, uh, especially if you think about polymers or strings. They have exponentially large uh, density of states. Um, and so uh, we expect something exponentially large. And as we saw, 10 to the 122 is a huge number. 
For gravity, so here's the subtlety. The Hamiltonian annihilates all physical states. So this partition function is just the trace of one. Okay, it just counts the number of states. Um, likewise, the energy is zero for all physical states. And, uh, and so on the right-hand side, we just have e to the s. But the number of states has to be bigger than one. I guess it could be equal to one. I should put an equality there. But for a universe, we don't expect uh, one physical state. Uh, so the entropy, uh, the entropy has to be positive. And, and for the saddle point approximation to be valid, the exponent has to be positive. So in this case, it has to be negative. In this case, it has to be positive. It's the opposite behavior. OK, so now maybe it's not too surprising that the Euclidean action for the uh, uh, giving the entropy of a black hole or de Sitter spacetime, Euclidean action is negative so that the exponent is positive. So let's go to cosmology. Uh, I've put in this lapse function here. Yes? Uh, I'm just going to, yeah, it's time reparameterization invariant. So any system in, which is invariant under time reparameterization has a vanishing Hamiltonian. Okay, that's a theorem. So string theory, uh, any geometrical theory always has vanishing Hamiltonian. As you see here, all I've done is introduce a lapse multiplying the time. So n could be any function of t. And the theory is invariant under reparameterizations. And then basically, it's a one-line argument to show that implies the Hamiltonian must be 0. OK? So the way it works is that the path integral over this lapse enforces a constraint that the total Hamiltonian is 0. OK? Essentially, it's set, you see, if the Hamiltonian was not 0, then time evolution would mean something. But in, in GR, there's no preferred time. The time coordinate is just an arbitrary choice. So you can't really have a. Hamiltonian, otherwise that would define a time, uh, a particular time, and there is no particular time. So the resolution is the Hamiltonian is zero. So the way we'll do this is first trace over the radiation. Okay, so we have the gravitational Hamiltonian. This governs the scale factor of the universe, and the radiation Hamiltonian, the usual um, E squared plus B squared uh, Hamiltonian. And we'll treat the radiation as a conformal fluid at a certain temperature. We just trace over the radiation. By the way, it's very important in this calculation that the radiation is conformally invariant, so it doesn't see the expansion of the universe. It completely decouples from gravity. The total Hamiltonian is just a sum of two terms. So when we do the radiation trace, we get the normal formula. SR is the radiation. Uh, entropy, UR is the internal energy of the radiation, uh, and, uh, and then we continue this formula by saying beta is IN uh, to calculate this trace of E to the minus IHRN. And uh, voila, so we've traced over the radiation. We're left with the trace over the metric. Okay, so now we have to do this gravitational path integral. Uh, this, this we do, just write down the action. Uh, these two terms come from the Einstein-Hilbert term. Here's the cosmological constant. Here's the radiation. I forgot to write the matter. It should also be matter term down here. And we just have to do this uh, path integral. And there's some definition of uh, these constants. And the way we'll do this path integral is just by finding saddle point, finding the classical solution plug it into the action, and that gives, gives us the gravitational entropy. So uh, I think I'll skip this. This is a side point on uh, quantum field theory and curved space-time. Um, so here we have uh, the metric again, Friedman equation. I forgot to put the matter in here as well. Um, and basically, they're all the classical solutions. You can think about them all just, just by realizing this is a particle in a quartic potential. Here are the different cases. So you have a universe coming out of the Big Bang and recollapsing, or a universe bouncing like De Sitter spacetime, but it can have some matter and radiation in it, so that 
changes its evolution a, a little. Um, and then there are various uh, analytic continuations of such spacetimes to imaginary time. And I won't uh, dwell on them, but we analyzed uh, all of them. Um, here is the picture uh, of, of the case of a flat universe um, uh, in the complex T-plane. So the magnitude of A of T in the complex T-plane. So A of T has zeros, like the Big Bang, and it has poles, like the future De Sitter spacetime. Um, it's a kind of curious thing that the fundamental domain in the complex T-plane is square for a flat universe. Okay, there's a special symmetry for a flat universe, which is that the, uh, if there's spatial curvature, then this fundamental domain is still rectangular, but uh, has different uh, lengths in the two directions. So, uh, so here's the um, modulus of A of T. And then because of this double periodicity, you see actually this represents a torus. Uh, this is a function defined on a torus. And uh, whereas the real time evolution is along here, the imaginary time evolution being periodic can be thought of uh, as defining an imaginary time contour, which goes, wraps around a torus. And the action is just the action along a non-contractible loop around that cycle of the torus. So it's a topological invariant. Uh, here it is. So again, these are some particular cases in the complex uh, T-plane. Here's the torus. The IS we calculate is the action or exponent IS calculated along a non-contractible loop around this torus, and that gives the formula for the entropy. Uh, so last month, there was this article in Quanta magazine about our work and they made a rather nice picture for us. Uh, and basically this says that imagine I've got an ensemble of universes. It might just be some notional ensemble. They don't have to exist. And uh, that ensemble gives universes with different cosmological parameters. We now have a formula that tells us the weight, the statistical weight you should associate with each such geometry. Okay? And, and again, emphasize they don't have to exist. This is not a multiverse, this is just the a priori probability of getting a certain geometry. So it provides the probability measure on cosmologies, and it turns out, if you, as you read in our paper, you get long formulae involving Jacobi elliptic functions, uh, and, uh, but you can do all the integrals analytically, and uh, then plot the entropy as a function of the curvature of the universe, and it turns out the most likely universes are homogeneous, isotropic, and flat. Now this I haven't explained, the homogeneous and isotropic, so flat we can get from the results I explained. Homogeneous and isotropic, we do small perturbations of the entropy. We show those correspond to de any perturbation decreases the entropy, just like uh, inhomogeneity in the gas in the, this room would decrease the entropy. Perturbations of the universe decrease the entropy, and that, that's therefore why the maximum entropy state is homogeneous and isotropic. You don't need any primordial flattening or smoothing mechanism, right? like inflation or ekparotic universes, one of my former sins. <laughs> you don't need anything like that. Okay? Just take Einstein gravity and calculate the entropy, and it explains why the universe is flat. Cosmological constant, of course, is of huge interest, massive puzzle called the biggest problem in physics. And this calculation actually gives you a very good clue about what the cosmological constant is. One interpretation of it, which I particularly like, is it's nothing but a Lagrange multiplier for Euclidean four volume. Okay, so if you think about Euclidean action, it goes like lambda times the four volume. Okay, so think of that as a chemical potential for the four volume. Okay, so I calculate my Euclidean action as a function of lambda, but lambda is really just a proxy for four volume. And you can now actually go backwards and figure out what's the density of states as a function of four volume, and, uh, and it's very interesting. 
Large four volume requires small positive lambda. The ensemble doesn't exist for negative lambda, so people doing ADS, you're out of luck. There's no ensemble for ADS space times. Uh, if lambda is positive, there is a meaningful statistical ensemble, and uh, small positive, uh, the most probable space times are one with small positive lambda. And then very recently, just in the last couple of days, uh, I, I have uh, realized this fact that, in fact, a well-defined ensemble for the three volume, the spatial three volume, requires that lambda is bigger than the matter density. And today, lambda is about 0.7, critical density. Matter density is about 0.3. So the universe seems to be uh, consistent with that. This idea that small lambda is favored, by the way, is pre prefigured. Hawking wrote a paper about it, Sidney Coleman. People noticed this, the De Sitter result is that the entropy goes like one over lambda. And so and the probability is e to the one over lambda. So Hawking wrote a paper saying the cosmological constant is probably zero because the peak of e to the one over lambda is at, as lambda goes to zero plus. Um, but I think there's a new argument now that actually there's a lower bound on lambda as well as an upper bound. And it seems to be consistent with what we see. So I have a final topic, but... Um, I think in view of the time, I will skip it just to allow time for questions. So uh, unless anybody asks me, I won't explain this cancellation mechanism. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I have one other slide. Where did it go? I seem to have lost a slide. OK, I won't explain that either. I will, exp oh, here it is. Density perturbations. OK, so it's essentially another topic. But I told you that there is a simpler way to get the observed density perturbations. Let me just say a couple of words about that. I told you the trace of the stress tensor was 0 in the first approximation. In the standard model, it's not 0. Okay? It's small. And the dominant contribution at high temperature actually comes from hypercharge, the U1 gauge coupling that is not asymptotically free. It turns out that in the non-abelian gauge theory plasma, the trace of the stress tensor scales as temperature, at high temperature, whereas the density is going like t to the fourth. So it becomes irrelevant at high temperatures. It's very, very subdominant. In the abelian theory, the trace scales as t to the fourth. And this is a well-known result calculated a long time ago. It goes like the fine structure constant for hypercharge squared. And then you have to add up all the different particles in the plasma and their hypercharges. So you get some number. So then I can uh, go through, well, I won't have time to go through this. But basically, you, you have some extra fields around. These are what we call dimension zero fields. You introduce them in such a way as to cancel this trace, to restore conformal symmetry. They don't introduce any new degrees of freedom into the theory. Uh, all they do is cancel the trace anomaly. And it turns out these fields give you density perturbations with a scale invariant spectrum. And the amplitude turns out to be uh, to differ from what we see by about a third. It's amazingly close to what we see. And it turns out there actually are some, some uh, dimensionless numbers you, you have to fiddle to get the right answer. Um, but as far as I know, this is the first calculation of the primordial density fluctuations from standard model uh, physics. So um, I will stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? So, do you think there's any um, correspondence to some of these Monte Carlo methods for yes. summing over triangulations of metrics? And 
Yes. Could there be some numerical evidence for this also? From so, gravity is, of course, unusual because the kinetic term is negative. Kinetic term for the scale factor A is negative. So, uh, the Hamiltonian is zero on physical states, and viewed as an operator, it's not positive uh, semi-definite. Uh, it can take both signs off shell. Um, and so, so in fact, it, let, this is an excuse to, sh to show something. This is the kind of system you want to look at. You see, if you're doing quantum field theory in a curved space-time, partly motivated by our work on the no-boundary proposal, we basically said you must take the Lorentzian path integral seriously and look at these saddle points as complex saddle points and then decide if they're relevant or irrelevant. Partly motivated by this, Konsevich and Siegel and Witten considered quantum field theory in complex spacetimes. And they classified those spacetimes according to whether the quantum field theory makes sense or doesn't make sense. And basically, it's all about the wick rotation. Uh, oh, you can't see this. The allowed region is actually the negative imaginary lapse. This n is the lapse. Leave t as a coordinate, but, but do the wick rotation as a function of n. So this is Euclidean quantum field theory. lives down here. Okay, And these people argued quantum field theory does make sense in complex spacetimes, but only within this half plane of the lapse. Now, actually, what we're doing is inconsistent with that, because what we do is start from the Lorentzian path integral. We do a weak rotation this way for the matter. But that doesn't work for gravity, because it has a negative kinetic term. So we integrate out the matter using a standard weak rotation. And then we do the opposite weak rotation for gravity. Okay. Now, if you think about that, that's, that's very strange, because that corresponds to negative temperature. And negative temperature sounds like a no-no, but in fact, negative temperature is fine for systems with finite number of states. And this is well known in Kinet's matter, for example, that if you have a spin system, for example, which uh, you know the spins can all be down in the ground state, for example, yeah, classically they're all down in the ground state. In the most, in the highest energy state, they're all up. But there's only a, there's a finite number of states. And the partition function negative temperature is perfectly fine. It just means all the spins are up. Okay, So um, you get into issues like that. So what you need to look for is a system with uh, you know, a Hamiltonian that's not positive, but, but has a finite number of states. And then you will have something that corresponds to gravity. So uh, in, yeah, I, it, it's not obvious to me what type of systems would be the best models for this. Yeah. Yes. To the Higgs. Yeah, it's a great question. There is no Higgs. <laughs> no, it's a great question. So uh, again, if you will allow me to cheat and show show the slide. You see, we, we started off by noticing something very trivial, which is that imagine we're allowed to introduce scalar fields with the kinetic term box phi squared, not grad phi squared. OK? Yeah, that's the, that's the canonical view, is that the theories with higher derivatives are unstable. However, people don't seem to be aware of the fact that Bogolyubov proved this theory, this particular theory, uh, which he called a gauge theory, by the way, has only one physical state, which is the vacuum. It has no particle states at all, no excited states at all. And essentially, the argument is that this is, uh, has an infinite dimensional symmetry, phi goes to phi plus alpha, with Oh, the box should be on the alpha, with box alpha equals zero. OK, so there's an infinite dimensional symmetry, and that symmetry turns out to remove all the physical states apart from the vacuum. 
in the vacuum, you get a scale invariant power spectrum. And that's why I got interested in this theory, because we look at the microwave sky, we see scale invariants. I, I said, what's the simplest imaginable explanation? Well, there's some field in the universe which has a scale invariant power spectrum, D3, and it's this dimension zero scalar. Okay, so there's only one physical state. So it's, no pro it's not a pathological theory at all. The best way to understand it is BRST, symmetry. And uh, again, BRST proves that there's only one physical state. There's, by the way, very large literature on these things. None of it seemed to be aware of the existence of this BRST argument. It's a paper by Revell, which seems to be virtually unnoticed, which shows that. So we have some stuff we can add to the standard model without any, adding any new particles. All it does is change the vacuum. And then our observation was, here's the stuff that if you add the right number of these dimension zero scalars, turns out to be 36, you simultaneously cancel the vacuum energy and both contributions to the trace anomaly in the standard model, and you predict there are three generations of particles. Okay? This cancellation requires three generations of particles in the standard model and no more, and, and they have to include right-handed neutrinos. Okay? So, it's an amazingly simple mechanism which makes quantum field theory couple better to gravity. And then you, ah, but no Higgs. <laughs> the cancellation only works if there is no fundamental Higgs. Okay? And so what's the Higgs? So the Higgs must be a composite of these dimension zero scalars. And actually, there's a very natural mechanism for forming a composite, which is just copied from string theory. Because in string theory, the world sheet coordinate is a dimension zero field, has logarithmic correlations. E to the i k dot x, the vertex operator, has non-zero conformal dimension. And so that's my guess. That's what the Higgs field is. It's a E to the i phi, where phi is a dimension zero field and the Higgs is a composite, probably multiplied by fermions, which give it the right gauge quantum numbers. But it's only a guess, but indeed, very good point. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Yes. I, the conversation is really interesting, but <laughs> okay. mindful yes. of time. All right. So once again, uh, thank you, uh, Neil, for your uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. So we are now uh, running uh, five minutes behind. Sorry. Uh, okay. Well, we will take over coffee break. <laughs>